Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. My name is Carmen Barsotti, and I'm here with Selena Lane and Alex Starr. Some of you may remember Selena, who was the director of the Up on Top After School program and who is one of our board members. And Alex Starr is a longtime fool and a member of this congregation. We share this service with you this morning as faithful fools. April 1st is our High Holy Day, and so in this month of April, we reflect upon and celebrate our work and mission. Now we are fools, and the prankster gods are ever present, so bear with us if anything goes awry. Whether you're a longtime member, or this is your first time here, or anything in between, we're so glad you are with us. If this is your first time, you can download the order of service on our website. We hope you'll consider joining the Zoom coffee hour right after the service, and you'll find the link in the chat toward the end of the service and in the description of the video. We also want to take a moment to just acknowledge all the people who make this worship possible. We have a magnificent live stream team, Jonathan Silk and AV and Tech, Shuli Ong and Eric Shackleford on the cameras, Joe Chapeau, who is on the other end of the chat, and Les James and Thomas Brookshire hosting our coffee hour. And then we have faithful Leland Jones as our sexton today. And we thank the earth, Amy Kelly, and all the people who brought forth these beautiful flowers in the sanctuary. And our merry musicians, our Reiko Oda Lane, our organist. The soloists are Brielle Marina Nielsen, Asher Davison, and Ben Rudiak Gould and Mark Sumner, our choir director and pianist. And I also want to call attention to the lively and powerful cover, a print made by Alicia Lee Farnsworth, who lives in Clear Lake, California. And lastly, I thank all of you for being with us this morning. As we have each Sunday since March 2020, we begin by lighting the blue candle and I ask Alex if he would light it in honor of all of you. Even as we cannot gather together in body, with this flame, we make visible your presence. Welcome again, everyone. Please join us in singing and moving to the rhythm of our first hymn, Wo Ya Ya. It can be found in your order of service. Oh yeah, yeah, 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 oh yeah, yeah
Please say with me the words of our chalice lighting printed in the order of service. We light this chalice for the light of truth, the warmth of love, and the fire of commitment. We light this symbol of our faith as we gather together. Good morning. So we've been doing this for about 60 weeks now. I know all of you are probably very used to watching the worship service on YouTube. It feels very different on this end. I was telling a friend about it and I realized that um, the worst thing I could do is make a fool of myself. I think this might help. Uh, each of you may wanna look around with your inner eye perhaps there's probably something similar in your presence right now. Aha! That feels better. I invite all of you to take your hat, visible or invisible, and put it on your own head. Don't be shy, nobody's watching. Okay, that's pretty good. One more step. This is a robe made of clothes given to me by friends as I prepared to go out and sleep on the streets on my first overnight street retreat with the faithful fools. Doesn't that look good? All right, here we go. If you haven't already, we would invite you to download the order of service for this morning's worship from our website. In it, you'll find more details about today's service, lyrics for our hymns, and more. In, also in the order of service is information about the many events and offerings coming up in this community, opportunities to connect with others, to learn, to serve, and to practice together. I hope you'll read through and join in any that are of interest to you. I draw your attention to just a few. Today after worship, you're invited to join a town hall on the proposed Eighth Principle. Members of the Eighth Principle Task Force will share more about the origins of the Eighth Principle and what its adoption will mean for this community. If you haven't already attended one of the Eighth Principle gatherings at coffee hour, or even if you have, Today's town hall is a great way to get up to speed about the eighth principle before the congregational meeting on June 6th, where we'll vote on adopting it. This month, the Minister's Book Club will be reading The Wild Iris by Louise Gluck. This may be the shortest book by the Minister's Book Club has ever read and you've still got plenty of time to join the discussions at the end of the month. Finally, you'll have an opportunity later in the service to support the work of the faithful fools in today's offering. We are grateful for the foundational relationship and support that makes this work possible. I now invite you to join us in the meditation on breathing. When I breathe in, I'll breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I'll breathe out love when I breathe in. Breathe. 
Please join me as we say together our covenant and sing the doxology. The words of the covenant are printed in the order of service. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its prayer. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth and freedom and to help one another. ritual of ringing the gong seven times began in July 2019 with the revelation of the conditions in our detention camps for undocumented immigrants and the seven children who died in our federal custody from neglect. We have rung it, remembering the lives lost to COVID-19 as well. As we ring the bell this morning, we do so not only remembering those lives held and those lives lost in federal custody in our detention camps, but for all the human suffering and deep loss all over this world in the course of natural and human catastrophes. The ringing the bell this morning reminds us these words of Bernie Glassman. Attention, attention. When we say attention, what do we mean? When we really listen, when we really pay attention to the sounds of joy and suffering in the universe, then we are not separate from them. We become them. Because in reality, we are not separate from those who suffer. We are them. They are us. It is our suffering and it is our joy. As we ring the bell seven times, may we let the sound resonate in us, through us, and out into the world. 
let it radiate out toward the places and the people we are called to remember and bear witness for. When I first came to the Bay Area, I worked with a spiritual teacher, Rasa Leah Landman. Rasa was a teller of teaching tales, and each Sunday night, a group of us would gather in Berkeley, and as we sat in quiet and meditation, Rasa would tell an ancient tale, and when she finished, she would say quietly, and let us sit a while. It allowed time for us to be with the tale and to see what it moved within us as we listened. This morning for our meditation, I will tell the tale of the Fisher King. I invite you to sit comfortable, close your eyes if you'd like, see who, what, and wherever something may arise as you listen and then we will sit for a moment in quiet. The tale begins with the king as a boy, having to spend the night alone in the forest to prove his courage so he could become king. While he is spending the night alone, he is visited by a sacred vision in the fire appears the Holy Grail, a symbol of God's divine grace. A voice said to the boy, you shall be the keeper of the Grail, so it may heal the hearts of all people. But the boy was blinded by greater visions of life, filled with power and glory. In this state of radical amazement, he felt for a brief moment, not like a boy, but invincible like God. So he reached into the fire to take the grail. And the grail vanished, leaving him with the hand in the fire and to be terribly wounded. As this boy grew older, his wound grew deeper until one day life for him lost its reason. He had no faith in any human, not even himself. He couldn't love or feel loved. He was sick with experience and he began to die. One day a fool wandered into the castle and found the king alone. And being a fool, he was simple-minded. He didn't see a king. He only saw a man alone and in pain. And he asked the king, what ails you, friend? The king replied, I'm thirsty. I need some water to cool my throat. So the fool took a cup from his bedside and filled it with water and handed it to the king. And the king began to drink. He realized his wound was healing. He looked at his hands and there was the Holy Grail, that which he sought all of his life. 
he turned to the fool and said with amazement, how could you find that which my brightest and bravest could not? And the fool replied, I don't know. I only knew that you were thirsty. So let us sit a while. hot or cold, but if you are lukewarm, I shall spit you from, your, from my mouth. I don't know when the moment was that these words from the book of Revelations took up occupancy in my brain, but they have been there a very long time and often show up at any moment to call me to account. Say what you mean, and mean what you say. Just do what needs to be done. Don't just sit there, do something. If you seek to save your own life, you will lose it. Be quiet for a moment and listen. It was 1998 when Kay Jorgensen, who was social justice minister in this congregation, and I named our organization Faithful Fools. Maybe more like we challenged ourselves by calling ourselves fools. The fool from the tarot deck represents new beginnings. Its meaning is that you are stepping out into the world with faith in the future though you don't know what to expect. The journey requires improvisation and trust and a willingness to be shaped along the way. Well, that about sums it up how it's been and how it is every day in this fool's journey. 
We stepped out, and soon many others were stepping with us, including Alex and Selena. Our life experiences vastly different, and our longings consonant with one another. We simply long to see, to listen, to care, and to act. Not so unlike the fool in the tale of the Fisher King, who asked the king, what ails you, friend? And the king replies, I am thirsty. He was heard, and right action is possible if we listen. Healing is possible when one is heard. We walk up and down the hill from the church to the Tenderloin, move back and forth between the streets of the U.S. and streets of Nicaragua. We march from the plazas and alleys into City Hall. We hold open the doors of schools and universities and invite learning to happen while engaged in a community. We sit as community advisory members in the boardrooms of hospitals and challenge them to speak up with us with other residents for the needs of the community they serve. We accompany people who for decades, even century, have lived and continue to live the consequences of many faces of slavery and racism. And we see every day the reality of income inequality on the sidewalks as they are becoming more crowded with people and tents, while the news reporters tell us how many more billionaires have been made in this year. We pay attention and work daily with others to respond when people tell us, I need a safe place to sleep, and not just sleep, but a safe place to live. I need fresh water to drink. I need food that is nourishing and not expired and bruised. I need a bathroom morning, noon, and nighttime. I need to see people who reflect my race, my experience, my gender and identity at the table and in the offices where decisions are being made. I need a caring community of people. Lately, I've been reflecting on the interior life of the fool and on the need for my own interior life to be intact in order to be sustained in the intensity of the work we do, in order to speak and act clearly in the midst of ever-growing complexities in our world and in individual lives. We commonly think of the fool as a kind of simpleton, a light-hearted, brightly dressed, clown-like character who entertains common folks and royalty and makes us laugh. We don't often expect a fool to make us think or to take a good look at ourselves in the mirror to be one who entertains, while at the same time is given the task to fearlessly speak truths or deliver difficult news to kings and townspeople, requires not only wit, but an understanding of one's own humanness and shortfallings. It requires thoughtfulness and compassion guided by a good dose of intuition and intelligence, as well as some sleepless nights. To be a fool requires me, requires every one of us, to have a constancy of character and integrity, no matter our company. Whether I am with rulers or townspeople, whether sitting at the doorway of someone's tent or a residential hotel room, 
or whether I am in the chambers of city supervisors or with developers or CEOs in boardrooms or speaking to foundations and funders. I simply am called to say what needs to be said or do what needs to be done. An interesting fact I read about the court jester in medieval times was that it was one of the career options held by men that was completely open to women. It's why I was delighted when I found the print used for today's service in a little art center in Middletown, California, with a female jester moving through the world with energy and determination. In asking to use it, I learned from the artist, Alicia Farnsworth, that she carved this in 1998 while living homeless in the Tenderloin, the same year we found it the fools. A fool may be simple, but there is nothing simple about the work we all need to be about. There is a lot of devastating news to deliver to kings and townspeople. Every week as we ring the bell of remembrance, we name some of the difficult news, but the bell is not to pacify us. It is to say, attention, attention. It is a wake-up call. It is a call to action. We have to listen, to take in, feel the sorrow and the rage, the strength and the resilience flow through our veins as we grapple with our own ignorance, our own complicit selves and institutions, and then discern right speech and right action, sometimes all in a split second and with a lifetime commitment. Now, because we are fools and laughter is essential in the face of very serious business, I leave you with a little story of a wise and witty jester who demonstrates how we can deliver news to the kings. In the 14th century, legend has it that the court jester was called upon to tell King Philip VI that his fleet was destroyed by the English in the Battle of Sluice. He burst in on the king saying, the coward English, the dastard English, the faint-hearted English. And the king then responded, why do you abuse them? To which the jester supposedly stated, because they would not jump out of their ships into the sea as our brave Frenchmen did. No room for lukewarmness when it's about all of our lives. You know, I'm getting a little bit tired of wearing masks all the time, as I imagine some of you are. But one of the great things about masks is you can't tell who's got a clown nose on and who doesn't. Unless, of course, they put it on their ears. We are so lucky to have the faithful fools connected to our community, to have a fool speaking truth and inspiring us to act as the fools act in their deeply reflective manner, speaking truth to power, offering drinks to people, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, those things, those values that we speak about. And it takes resources to act. And sometimes the fools are able to make a lot happen with just a little, maybe even offering someone a drink with only two pennies. But this is our opportunity to help the fools have even more resource. I invite you to click on the donate button on the order of service. Uh, the link is often posted in the chat as well. Make sure to mark it as a special offering for this week so that the money can go and support the ongoing work of the faithful fools so they can continue speaking truth to power 
and inspiring all of us. Thank you. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down, down where you ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, true power to bend, we shan't be ashamed to turn. One of the lines from the song was, when true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we shan't be ashamed. Carmen introduced me as Selena, the former Up On Top director. Um, but I've been in social work for children, youth, and family my entire career. I'm a native to San Francisco. I love bragging about that no matter where I am in the world, but especially here when most of my colleagues and I are from such different backgrounds. As an African-American woman, I've come into work from a really um, unapologetic space. <laughs> One of the ways in which I show up for work is I usually bring in icebreakers or games um, that I learned as a young child, which was life skills through physical play. Um, and I think that kind of helped me automatically become a fool. <laughs> One of the things that we do um, kind of as an icebreaker or community building strategy is play a game called If You Really Knew Me. Uh, and this game is so that you can't just look at my physical appearance and know something about me. Yeah, you can't see my gorgeous smile, but you can see my long braids and the complexion of my skin. But there are some other things that are really essential. So when we play this game, um, it's really to, again, try to invite some reciprocity between myself and my community, the young people, the parents, uh, staff, and other folks that I encounter. Um, for example, if you really knew me, you'd know I grew up in a place called the Geneva Towers in the Sunnydale District of San Francisco. And there were 15 of us, and my grandmother raised us. If you really knew me, you'd know that I am one of 46 first cousins. If you really knew me, you'd know that I've lived at 39 home addresses, uh, three years of that which I was homeless. If you really knew me, you'd know that I've had 19 members of my immediate family as known felons, which has interrupted my life decisions and how I govern in the world. If you really knew me, you'd know that both of my biological parents are substance abusers, yet and still they're alive and kicking. <laughs> by God's graciousness. <laughs> if you really knew me, you'd know that I've lost over a dozen family members to gun violence, including my youngest brother at the age of 22, leaving me to raise his two sons who are now 15 and 17. If you really knew me, you know that I was a fool through and through. <laughs> but not to be deceived, I am not one of the traditional fools. <laughs> I've been blessed in so many ways. One of the avenues and vehicles that have allowed for me to transform what I think society would have deemed statistically doomed was sports. If you really knew me, you'd know that I played organized sports for more than 25 years. And those sports were not just to get active. Sports was a thing that taught me values. I was able to be disciplined, I learned the importance of teamwork 
and how to overcome obstacles. I learned that defeat was also a characteristic that would help me catapult into the future. But it wasn't, again, just the sports. There were many amazing people that I met on the journey while dealing with those challenges and that adversity. They taught me how to be and live purposefully. I also call them earthly angels, some of whom are Steve Reimer, who's the reverend and minister at the Oakland First Baptist Church in Oakland, Kathy Sachs, who we departed this earth last May uh, unexpectedly. They were the co-founders of a program called the Samaritan Neighborhood Center. When my grandmother was evicted from the towers and we moved to Oakland, we had no resources. There was no family network. There was not a, a community of folks embracing us when we crossed the bridge. At that after-school program, these two white people who we had no affection or familiarity with, they taught us to attend after-school programs in a way that I had never known. They sent us to Christian summer camps. They provided a meal and a snack every single time we walked in the door. They gave us prizes and incentives for doing homework and turning in our report cards. We lived in a very kind of suspicious area of West Oakland where we needed a ride sometime from school to the after school program and then a safe ride home after it was dark. They went above and beyond the call of duty as an after school program. My grandmother, Gladys, she was diagnosed with colon cancer in the very early 80s. And Steve and Kathy would then schedule appointments to accompany her to and from appointments. At some point, we were, the 15 of us, were out of school for almost a year. And they would accompany us to appointments for immunization. They would show up during Thanksgiving with turkeys and the fixings. During Christmas, when there was no tree, there were wrapped gifts there provided by the Samaritan Neighborhood Center. I attended my first girls group and learned about puberty and all the other things from sex ed through a group called Choices. This program introduced us to something pretty amazing called Toastmasters. Not sure if you all heard of it. This amazing woman, Diane Butler, to this day, taught me the difference between a soup and a dessert spoon. <laughs> These fools and earthly angels of mine, they didn't stop there. Though the statistics and the circumstances of living in a low income, high crime community were there, other people continued to come in and flood into my community. I was introduced to a program founded by Linda Mornell called Summer Search. That program allowed me to have a passport and traveled to Costa Rica for a summer by the age of 15. I then was pushed into another area called Beating the Odds, now called Students Rising Above, through the support and interview of Wendy Takuda. And this program afforded me a free education at the University of San Francisco. I've met amazing contributors to that program, such as Susan and Ali Dumi, but I've also had these people never, ever give up on me, even at the times when I was doubting myself. I was taught by these earthly angels, these, these fools who came into my life purposely to keep letting my light shine. Many of them have said it repeatedly, and they don't all know each other, that I am the light of the world. So I've had to endure some pretty tough things, but more so than anything, I've had a village of people surrounding me and encouraging me along the way. There were sayings such as, each one teach one, the more you know, the more you grow. Friends are the family you choose for yourself. It takes a village to raise a child. What lies behind us and what lies before us are but tiny matters compared to what lies within us by the famous Ralph Waldo Emerson. But these community members did more than that. They allowed me, they modeled for me, they exercised for me intentionally how I was supposed to exist in the world. During this time of the pandemic, yes, we are socially distancing. There's a disconnect and most of us are sheltering in place. In fact, I run a homeless shelter for families, an emergency shelter for families impacted by homelessness right here in the Tenderloin, just a few blocks down the street. And I understand and I see it every single day how the social distancing and the impact of sheltering in place can take its toll on us. 
but please remember that we each have a responsibility to bring light into the world. This light that we bring into the world is a love of life. The darkness cannot extinguish the light that we bring forth. By sharing your light with others, you can prevent, pre I'm sorry, by sharing your light with others, you can prevent others from stumbling in the dark. In Galatians 9, 10, in Galatians 6, verses 9 and 10, it reads, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believer and faith. I know it can sometimes feel heavy hearted. It can be a little bit of a weight. Uh, we don't always get a thank you or a pat on the back. There's sometimes even very little recognition when we go out and do things for others. Yet and still, we should be the encourager. It can be discouraging to not receive those tangible rewards or results for your effort. However, we are to be challengers and to keep doing good and to trust God to provide the reward. We can be fruit bearers. We can call up a friend out of the blue to just see how they're doing. We can bake cupcakes, individual, not whole cakes, because it gets a little controversial sometimes. We can call up a friend and ask them for a recommendation for a TV show or an audio book. Uh, we can just sometimes have a really goofy smile and wave and <laughs> watch how the people react. We have an opportunity to be uplifters, carriers. We can have really creative ways. I had a group of young people make cloth masks for everyone in our shelter um, out of old t-shirts. Please don't feel like this pandemic is holding us back. This is an opportunity for us all to elevate and let our light shine. In due time, we will reap a new harvest and this harvest will be full of blessings a million times over. If you just keep letting your light shine, we'll be just fine. And so it is. Amen. I close my eyes and I can see a world that's waiting up for me that I call my own. Through the door, through the door, through and no what's been before, but it feels like home. They can say, they can say it all sounds crazy. They can say, they can say I've lost my mind. I don't care, I don't care, so call me crazy. We can live in a world that we design Cause every night I lie in bed The brightest colors fill my head A million dreams are keeping me awake I think of what the world could be A vision of the one I see A million dreams is all it's gonna take for the world we're gonna make. There's a house we can build. Every room inside is filled with things from far away. Special things I can pile, each one there to make you smile on a rainy Day. They can say, they can say it all sounds crazy. They can say, they can say we've lost our minds. I don't care, I don't care if they call us crazy. Run away to a world that we design. Every night. 
darkest colors fill my head. A million dreams are keeping me awake. I think of what the world could be. A vision of the world I see. A million dreams is all it's gonna take. A million dreams for the world we're gonna make. However big, however small, let me be part of it all. Share your dreams with me. You may be right, you may be wrong, but say that you'll bring me along to the world you see, to the world I close my eyes to see, I close my eyes to see. As every night I lie in bed, the brightest colors fill my head, a million dreams are keeping me awake. A million dreams, a million dreams, I think of what the world could be. A vision of the what I see A million dreams is all it's gonna take A million dreams for the world we're gonna make For the world we're gonna make So if you haven't yet taken the time to familiarize yourself with the image on the cover of the Order of Service, you can find it on a link to the Order of Service. I encourage you to take a look at it because this image of the fool, as is the case in so many Tarot decks, shows the fool stepping off the cliff package in hand, accompanied by their dog, heading off on the beginning of their journey. And as we were preparing today's worship, it felt to me like the beginning, or the beginning steps of the beginning, of us moving into the next phase after the pandemic times. And I started reflecting about my experience here at the church, beginning again and again in new ways, in new roles, as my own life and my role in the congregation changed. And so I spent hours reflecting on that, writing. I've got this great piece here. And then I realized the fool steps off into the unknown. So I'm going to step out and tell you about something totally different. I was remembering this morning an experience that I had the last time I was on a street retreat with the Faithful Fools. Now I've done dozens of these street retreats, led hundreds of people out into the streets, but this last November, as I was accompanying Meg McGuire on her first street retreat, as part of her work as uh, intern here at the congregation and working with the fools, I was scared. Was it going to be dangerous? Was I putting my family at risk in some way? There was so much that was unknown for me, and I realize now that these are the same kinds of questions faced by many people when they go out on their first or second or third or how, who knows how many street retreats. In this case, for me, the fear was mostly grounded in the reality of coronavirus. But I went out and I did it because I knew that that was going to be my commitment to accompany Meg as she had her street retreat and I went off on my own experience. So I was walking along and all of a sudden, this man dressed in a bright red tracksuit with shining white athletic shoes, went running up the street. And I thought, is he running from someone? Is he chasing someone? What's going on? But I didn't see anybody, so I figured it must not be a, a chase. As I turned around the corner, all of a sudden my eye was caught across the street 
by a person standing next to somebody lying prone on the ground. And it came to my attention that this person had had a drug overdose. Their heart had stopped beating. Their brain was beginning to lose the oxygen it needed to function. Fortunately, my brain still had oxygen, and I started thinking, how can I get this person help? So I ran down to the safe sleeping site on Fulton Street, where people are allowed to set up tents to provide a little bit of space in the midst of the pandemic. And I found some of the people from Urban Al Alchemy who were working there. I said, do you have Narcan? Which I knew to be a drug that people could take to reverse the effects of opiate overdose. One of them did, and they came with me, and the other one called in the ambulance. And then, before my eyes, as several people arrived with Narcan, including the man who had run off in bright red, it was administered to the man on the ground, and within a couple of minutes, he arose and walked away. Now that is a real beginning, to die to come back to life. He was stepping off the cliff into a new future. When I think of the fool, the fool is not stepping off the cliff alone. It's got the dog there. Perhaps that's the fool's community. It's got a suitcase or perhaps a knapsack on some of the images. And inside those cases are what the fool needs on their journey. In this case, I would hope that it would be this person's values. For when we are beginning our journey to have community, to have touch with our own values, what's important to us, can make a huge difference as we step into the unknown. Don't we all hope that this man, as he came back to life, was guided by his values, supported by his community? as we will be in this congregation as we step forward into the next stage of our own lives, coming back together. As we think about how we're building our own world in a new and brighter form, as Selena was referring to. Guided by the faithful fools and their concrete touch with what human needs are, This is what will make the difference to us. I'd like to think a little bit about what some of those values are. Our first principle of the inherent worth and dignity of all people. Our seventh principle of the interconnected web of existence of which we are all a part. And now as we're looking forward to this possibility of adding an eighth principle, one that addresses the systems of oppression and specifically that of racism and systemic racism. As we connect ourselves with these values and walk into this next unknown period, we can create a world that is more beautiful, informed by the pain that we've experienced over the past year or witnessed others experiencing, or perhaps by choosing to preserve some of the things that worked well for us in the last year. I know for me, the slow streets, the closed portion of the roads on Golden Gate Park were essential to my and my family's well-being. At the same time, we know we need to address health care, policing, income disparities, protecting people's housing. And I know that people in this congregation are already taking some of those steps. And as we begin to step out into the unknown, I invite you to think about how we can do that, to reach out to our neighbors, to walk with our friends who are from the Asian American community, who are facing anti-Asian racism, to work for voter, uh, voter rights to preserve our democracy. We have great potential, guided by our values, to step forward and create not a normal, but a new normal. From the light of days remembered, birds are become bright and clear, guiding hands and hearts and 
Thank you for joining us this morning and I hope that we all feel a little bit more fired up and I thank Alex and Selena for joining me. So we will share our blessing, our benediction as you go forth. May love surround us. May joy gladden us. May peace lie deep within. And may, and may you and, and all those you know go in peace. peace.